I always get letters where I meet people, and they say, Genukshan, must speak. Talk about Edelkeit. Talk about Kedusha. What do you have to talk about this? So I say, Baruch Hashem, we have thousands and thousands of shirim about beautiful topics, right? And Baruch Hashem, most people don't talk about this. I'm from the only few Mishagayim. So what do you have to listen to it? So why do I talk about it? The reason is because after every such class, I get probably 10 emails of people who say that they were completely destroyed. They wanted to take their lives. They were in a depression. And finally, they felt a little empathy and understanding of what they went through without telling them, shh, shh, their whole life, shh. The yeshiva.net. So everybody understood yesterday's class, I hope. Or if not understood, at least felt or experienced, which is better than understanding. <laughs> so let's continue. We're up to page 64. Lamed Bey's column two. Lamed Bey's, I mean, Ahmed Bey's. The line starts, Bey's David, Shehua Meshpacha Hayekara. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight lines from the top. Bez Dalad. You see, Malche Bez David, Shua Meshpacha Hayekara, Shechafetz Hashem Behem, Vekama Nevi'im Yatsu Gamken Mimena. Talking about the story of Yehuda, Judah, and Tamar, Yehuda and Tamar. which was Yehuda and Tamar, so to speak, ceded spiritual territory to unholiness. But it was extremely strategic because through that they both managed to extract, as he puts it, the spark of Mashiach, the seed of Melech Mashiach, the ultimate redeemer, and all of the kings of Beis David, which represents royalty, the royal family that Hashem chose, and also many prophets that came from this family. Because Yehuda and Tamar, they were the progenitors of the twins, Peretz and Zorach. And Peretz and Zorach, ultimately Peretz, was the great, 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 great grandfather of Bayaz, who was the father of Ovid, who was the father of Yishai, who was the father of David HaMelech, as we read on Shavuos and Megillus Rus. And... Uh, and thus, the whole Malchus based David, all the way to Mashiach. And as the Rambam says, the halach is Mashiach has to come, Mizera David Shlaima. It's one of the criteria that Mashiach comes from the seed of David Amalek. And Shlaima Amalek, it all comes from this flawed and blemished relationship between Yehuda and Tamar, which certainly was not conventional. It was not, would have, been, would have not been sanctioned by convention. To put it mildly, there was no Shatchan involved. Uh, quite to the other extreme, the way Tamar was presented herself, the way Yehuda engaged in it, the whole thing is problematic from a halachic and moral perspective. And uh, how is it then possible that from such a relationship, from such a, what would seem, unholy relationship, comes such goodness? So this is a classic example of this whole concept that Tamar understood that it's precisely through this that she's going to be able to ultimately defeat the Klippa. It's precisely through this relationship that the Klippas came out <laughs> and they weren't afraid of bringing out all their ammunition and all their energy and all their sparks. It seemed very, very promising. And in that process, they... Uh, managed to, so to speak, lose the battle and win a war. Some people win the battle and lose the war. Because it looks like the battle is what's most important. But in this case, you lost your pawn, but you won the war. You lost your battle, but you won the long-term war. And uh, this is a big theme in Kabbalah that uh, sometimes the greatest sparks of holiness come out in the most unexpected places. And it's not a mistake. It's precisely that way. And there's a few reasons for it. Number one, whenever there's intense goodness, the klipa surrounds it from all sides. Because it's like bees with honey. The bees go for the honey. Wherever there's more holiness, there's always a greater attraction 
of obstacles, of, of negativity, of toxicity. Right? If I want to rob, if I want to go rob, I'm not going to go to a beggar to rob. What am I going to find? A few hundred dollars that he collected here in China's shul? If I already want to do it, I go to the bank. <laughs> if I want to do it right. If I want to do it wrong, you go to the bank. That's where you, you go for the money, right? When Klippa wants to do it right, it doesn't go to a beggar. It goes to the source. That's why the Gemara says in Sukkah that Kol HaGadol Mechavedei, Yitzray Gadol. Somebody who's greater, the challenge is always greater. It's not just a mistake, or it's just you want to, you know, he has more power, so you have to challenge him more. It's much deeper than that. That's exactly what's attracting it. It's exactly what's attracting it. Because there's so much light, there's going to be an equal amount of negativity that's drawn to it, because that's where you could feed from. That's where you could feed from. You know, when the lions bring back a buffalo... Right? Now the meal starts. A little bird nobody's running to. You know, this is going to feed them for weeks. Amachaya, this is where you run to. Such a carcass, there's, there's good schayre if you can only defeat it. So a person has to realize this, that sometimes the intensity of the darkness or the anxiety is commensurate exactly with the intensity of light. And the worst thing is to get entangled rather than separate as we discussed in the previous classes. In order to get that light out, very often, the clippers are going to protect it so much. So there is a form of seeding territory, so to speak, in order to go into that space and where they seem to be claiming, to be claiming you as a casualty. But ultimately, it's all to destroy them. There's an interesting, uh, the Arizal writes that... Uh, Dafke blemished relationships, they'll put out these nitsutsus because they don't think anything is going to come out of it. It says in Chazal that Terach was married to a woman named Amasloi. And when she conceived Avraham, she was a nido. She was in the middle of her nida period. And her husband was Terach, who was no tzatzka. So what type of soul already is going <laughs> to... So, the, so, the, so who came out of Ramavinu? <laughs> The worst thing of Rabbi Vinu could have done is become entangled with his father's issues and mother's issues. The greatness of Avraham Avinu was that he knew who he was versus his parents. Don't, don't take that for granted. Because a child generally wants to be close to you, you want to be similar to your parents. You want to reflect your parents. That's good if you have parents like Yitzchak had. If you had parents like Avraham had, you have to be careful what's you and what's your parents. It's not such a simple thing. Especially when the parents scream, You know, Terach was screaming that, right? What happened to respect? Respect. Respect your father. Respect your father. You can only respect your father if your father respects the real father. If your father becomes an Avedizara, <laughs> what are you going to respect? So there's a machloikas hapoiskim, if a father is a rush, if there's a chi of kibudav. The Ramah Paskins no. Some say yeah. But nobody holds that if a father is abusive to a child, there's a chi of kibudav. You don't even have to respect your father with your money. It has to be with his money. So to respect your father with your health and with your life, <laughs> there's no mitzvah like that. If a father did things to a child, Rahman al Islam, I get a lot of emails about this. And then he tells the son, You have to respect me. Mm-hmm. If it's causing a person anxiety and stress and difficulties, they're not allowed to do it. It's pikoch nefesh. It's not, you have to have a very serious issue this. Okay, but anyway, that's not our topic today. So, what happens here with Yehuda and Tamar? So for example, if you have, a, I don't know, a, if you have a concert, and there's 50,000 people there, 100,000 people there. And uh, the main singer, who's like a, a world-renowned celebrity, needs to come in. The worst thing you can do is bring him in through the main entrance. Why? He's never going to get to the stage. Everybody's going to want to give him, uh, give him, greet him, and everybody's going to want an autograph, and everybody's going to want a selfie, and everybody's going to ask him for a favor. By the time he gets to the main stage, it's already the night is over. So what do they do? Everybody walks, in, everybody walks in through the main doors, beautiful doors. They walk in and they get their seats. And where do they take the main celebrity of the evening? 
They usually take him through a back door. They take him through the boiler room. They take him through side doors, through basements, right? Then he has to crawl through rabbit holes. He has to slip on the kitchen because they just mopped it. So he slips and falls. He goes through the ugliest and weirdest entrances to get to the backstage. That's what happens by most of these events. How you talking? <laughs> the answer is there's no way to get him in. But for my smuggling. You have to... <laughs> The biggest netsutsus in the world don't come in through regular ways. They don't come in through conventional ways. If they come through conventional ways, there's too many, too many things will stop them. They always come in through weird, strange ways. It says, Matsasi David Avdi. So the Medrash says, Matsasi, I found David. Where do you find him? What Metsiyu. So he says, but Zdoim. I found him in Zdoim. Because <laughs> Light with, was with his daughters, and from there came out Mayav. And Mayav was the grandfather of Rus, and Rus was the great grandmother of David. So David, from one side, comes from Yehuda and Tamar, and then from the mommy side, he doesn't do any better. He comes from Light and his daughters. Now, how, how holy was that relationship? The reason he's not bringing that an example is because Light was drunk. Yehuda and Tamar, they were both conscious, so it was more strategic. They were in a different place. Light had happened, but that God arranged. Light's daughters were knew what they're doing, but Light himself, he was completely drunk. But the same concept that through a very, very crazy, uh, uh, promiscuous, really even worse than Yehud Antom, it's a father and daughters, complete incest, like in Parshas uh, Vayeru, where the story is. From that came Rus. From this relationship came Rus. And this was problematic for all generations. The Gemara says in Yevamas that uh, Doeg told Shaul that, you know, David Amalek shouldn't be able to marry a, a Jewish woman. Because he comes from Mayav and uh, Loyavi Amoyni Mayavi Bekal Hashem. The Gemara says the Mayavi Veloy Mayavis, Amoyni Veloy Amoynis. But for generations, this was a question of David is allowed to marry an ordinary Jewish woman when his great grandmother was a Moabite woman. That itself shows you that David Amelech, David Melech Israel, the question was even if he's Jewish, but he's not a regular Jew. It's like a Mamzer. He can't marry a regular woman. And not only that, it says in Medrash, the Ramami Panu brings in a sorry remarks that his father Yishai separated from his wife, David's mother, at some point, because he got old, he became frum, and he decided his wife is uh, he's not uh, he's not kosher for his wife, because he comes from Rus, he comes from Mayav. Torah says Le'yavi Amayim Be'avi Bekalasha. And what happened? He decided to go to his shivcha, shivcha Knainis. He made a condition: if he's a Jew, he's liberating her. If he's not, he could marry a shivcha Knainis. But she was a smart woman, and she told his wife the whole story. And she told his wife, I don't belong there in the room, in the bedroom, you belong there. And Yishai thought he was with his shivcha, and really with his, his wife, and David came out of that relationship. And when he saw his wife was pregnant, he thought that there was adultery, and therefore they all treated David as a mamzer. That's why it says in Tehillim, David, it says, The children of my mother saw me as an alien. Muzar, mamzer, is mumzer, mumzar. They saw me as a, not from the family. Literally a mamzer. But why? Because the mother was pregnant. And Yishai said, this has nothing to do with me. I know that. And that's why when Shmuel Hanavi came to, uh, to, uh, to, to Yishai, and he said that Hashem wants to coronate one of your children as a king, so he asked Yishai to bring out all of the sons. And he brought out seven sons. And each one, Hashem said, this is not the king. And then he asked Yishai, do you have any more sons? So he said, there's one more shepherding the flock. And that's when he brought him. If he asked him to bring out all of his sons, why didn't he bring out all? He brought out seven because he didn't treat David as a son. David is a mamza. He was raised in the family, but he's his mother's son, his wife's son, it's not his son. Because he had no relations with his wife and his wife was pregnant. So obviously this was a mamza. And Hashem is going to coronate a mamza as a king. Just understand the drama here. And then Shmuel Anavi said, no, no, he's the boy. And that's when Yishai found out the whole story. And it says in Medrash that all the psukim and halal are about this story. When David HaMelech was vindicated because he thought he was treated as a mamza his whole life. He said, Oid Chashem ki anisani vatihili li shua, Evan Masu Habainim Haisalarish Pina, the stone that the builders were repulsed with became the cornerstone. The brothers were horrified, Yisha was horrified. And Shmuel Anovi said, Meis Hashem Haisalarish Niflas Beineno. And together they said, Zehayay Mas Hashem Nagilu Venis Mechabai. A memi fanu, Asar Mamarius brings this whole matter, she explains it. What do you see from here? That every element of this relationship 
Yehuda and Tamar and Light and his daughters and even Boyaz and Rus themselves. If you learn Rus, it wasn't so simple how, how Rus came to Boyaz. Again, there was no Shatchan there. It was the middle of the night. Vayilofis, Boyaz. Every element of the relationship seems to be more problematic than another. You would think such a holy family, ultimately Mashiach is going to come from there, Mashiach is going to clean the world, purify the world. It should be Afach Siddish So Zayin Afalit for Shinoifen. But Batamt. No, Batamt. Everybody can get up and speak at the Levort and say, In Vea Geffen, Bin Vea Geffen, Dover No Miskabel. You make a butter, you meet the Chveis, come once and get endic, then it's good. Huh? So this is what the Tzamech Tzedek is explaining, that al pipnimi Yisatayra, this wasn't a mistake. It was precisely this element. When Klippa has such a powerful hold, and it does because there's so much light there. There's so much, so much light there. So somebody has to go into that place in order to get it out. The worst thing, though, is to get entangled, and that's the tragedy. And that's the whole Nakuda that's being brought out, that when you, a person understands that what I went through and what I, what, w- w- the pain I experienced and the journey I went through, which was entangled with Klippa, number one, it has nothing to do with my soul. The soul itself remains completely pure. The chitzonius of the soul got affected, not the pnimius. Number two, even the chitzonius of the soul, why did it get affected? Not in order to be destroyed, but in order to ultimately defeat the Klippa. A person needs to remember that. So when these two Yisaitis are very, very clear, that I went down there and the eye can never get tarnished, despite everything, even though it feels that way. And number two, the reason that I got tarnished was only to be able to ultimately defeat it. I lost a pawn to win the chess game. And the reason the person can, can appreciate both of these truths is because the person understands essentially that the soul is a chilek alakamimal, so it's the ain't soif that went through this experience. It's infinite consciousness that went through all of this experience, and infinity can't get tame through tuma. So even that which was affected is only the chitzayin, it's not the way it's processed through my own perception. It's like the moon getting diminished only from our vantage point. Even though from our vantage point there's no moon, it's dark, but the moon itself is not dark. And the whole reason for that itself is only to be able to defeat the clipper. So then, ultimately, the soul has, the person has, doesn't have to worry, there's going to be complete liberation. But that journey is not an easy journey. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a dog that's called Bloodhound, a Bloodhound. Huh? You know how they train Bloodhounds? Bloodhounds, they're called, yeah? You could just see from the name, you can hear from the name what type of dogs they are. They're extraordinary in identifying, right, toxic people and toxic materials. And they're used especially in aggressive situations and in times of war and in violence. And they're very, very lethal. And they need them to be able to smell and identify certain things in the enemy. How do they train them? They don't want they become bl- professional bloodhounds. So if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> I'm not an expert in this, but uh, you could probably look it up in today's world. Whatever they want them to smell, let's say it's a bomb. It's a certain type of bomb. Let's say it's a certain type of radioactive material. Let's say it's blood. Whatever it is, a certain type of body, a certain type of odor, whatever it is, as they're younger, they give them a lot of that. So, and whenever they smell it, they get a prize. <laughs> so as they're growing up, they have so much access to this particular smell because they constantly give it to them. They constantly over. They'll give them blankets that has this odor and paper that has this odor and wood that has this odor. They're always around it. So this becomes like, this is what they're so used to. Mama Lush. And they get rewarded. Now, when they're in the wild and they're in dangerous situations and it's not so easy... But when they sense the smell, uh, they know it. <laughs> they know it. They grew up with this. You know, a smell that's familiar, you know. Das kenech, this I know. It's like the language you know. So when they smell it, when they're big boys, and they smell it from far, they right away identify it. But why do they identify it? They know exactly what it is. You understand my nimshal here? 
The only people who can root out abuse from the community are people who know how to smell it. The only people who know how to smell it, for real, are the people who experienced it. There's no other way of rooting really things out. When you went through something and you went through for years, you smell it. People who are very pure and they grew up with purity are Gavaldika people, but they can't smell impurity. <laughs> people who went through impurity and they didn't become entangled, when they see it, they know this is toxicity and they bark. And that's what roots it, roots it out. So they, they had casualties. They had to go there. They had to go into that bloody place to know what it feels like. So now they can, they can destroy it. So it's always going into that place, going into the Levusha Mizbada, which is a difficult journey. But in that process, in that process, you bring it out. <laughs> you bring it out. It's attracted to you. You know it and you feel it and you experience it and you get it. And then you have the ability to defeat it. Okay, now let's see Vaita. He says Vaita in parentheses. Once Torah was given, He's now making a qualification with Yehuda and Tamar. Does everybody come, and if they're in a situation where they see a Tamar, they say, you know what? I'm going to go in there. I'm going to cede my moral territory. And the Vaila, I'll be able to destroy the Klippa, just like Yehuda and Tamar. So he says, once the Torah was given, a person is not allowed to do this. There are situations that the Navi tells the Jew temporarily to be Mechal Shabbos, or like the Meister with Eliyahu Anavi. Eliyahu Anavi was makri of a carbon outside of the Beis HaMikdash. In the story with Mount Carmel and Melachim, Yudzayim, Melachim Beis, I think, chapter Yudzayim, the story of Kisisa, right? He does that whole contest between the 400 prophets of the Baal, you know the story. And he created, he made, brought the two oxen outside. How do you allow to be makrev outside of the base of Mikdash? It's called the Isr Shchute Chutz, you're not allowed to. The answer is Elio was a Navi, and the halacha by a Navi is a love to Shmo, and even if he tells you to violate the Torah temporarily, you have to listen to him, if he's already an established prophet. If he permanently changes a mitzvah, for example, he says Shabbos is not Shabbos anymore, it's Sunday, then you know he's a false Navi, because then he's undermining the Torah of Moshe. And Moshe's prophecy is more greater than all because Moshe's prophecy was seen by everybody. It's not hearsay. It wasn't one person who convinced us. All Jews were at Maimon Har Sinai. So the power of a Navi comes from Moshe. So if the Navi undermines Moshe, he loses his own power. But if the Navi doesn't change what Moshe said, but he says, Hashem said that today we should be makar of a carbon outside and he's an authenticated Navi from the past, you have to listen to him. The same is true if he says to be Michal Shabbos, just this Shabbos. Besides, if he says, Avoy disorder, then you never listen to him. Then you know he's an Avi Shak. So there are those, those situations of a Navi. That's the halach. He loved to Shmon. Even if the Rambam in Hilchis Yisrael, the Atayra, explains this at length. Perek Zayim, Perek Ches, Perek Tes. A love to Shmon in Parshas Re'e. Esther? Right. To go with Hashem, you say. So, the, so, so he says, so that can also be after Matan Taira. But those are unique situations. A person on his own to go say, I'm going to go be Michal Shabbos, I'm going to go eat treif, I'm going to go to Tamar, I'm going to go to situations like Tamar, because I have this strategy, if I'm put into a situation, I'm put into a situation. To go create that situation, for this you have to have a vision that after Matan Taira we don't have, and we can't have, and we're not supposed to have. And what's this idea of Elio saying to be makrev outside? It's the same idea. You surrender some in order for a lot of profit. Just like when a person invests. You're giving up money. And maybe for 5 or 10 or 20 years. And this money you could have used. But you're imagining and hoping that this money that you're losing, you're manichim ktsas. But the profits are amazing. So the, to be makar of a carbon outside of the base of meters is not a simple thing. In other circumstances, it would be an avera. It would be a sin. What does it mean, a sin? A sin means that it is something that belongs to Klippa. The Klippa wins. So it's like in the casualties of war that you sent your own troops to be defeated by the enemy. That's what happened. But Eliyahu Hanavi, or similar situations, understood 
that this is exactly what's necessary in order to bring out the clip and then defeat it. There's a concept of Shabbos, the Pikuach Nefesh on Shabbos. There's certain things you'll have to be Mechal of Shabbos for, like saving a life. So the question is if it's if Shabbos is Tchuya or Hutra. Well, let's say you eat on Yom Kippur because you, for health reasons, you have to eat. So is it Tchuya or Hutra? What's the difference? Tchuya means it's rejected. Shabbos is rejected, it's pushed away. Hutra means it's permitted. The difference is, Tchuya means that it's actually a problem. But the Torah says, I'm fine with doing something wrong because of a greater benefit. Hutra means that in this situation, the laws of Shabbos were not said. Do you say that when it comes to Pekor HaKnefesh, when somebody goes to Atzala to save a person's life, the laws of Shabbos were not given in this situation? In other words, for the Atzala person, it's like Thursday. It's Thursday. Or you say, no, it's Shabbos, and you're not allowed to. But the Torah says, even though it's a problem, I'm telling you, do it, because saving a life is more important. A doctor amputates chas v'shalom, a part of a person's body, right? He's not going to say it's not a problem. It's a big problem, but it's worth it to save the life. Unlike the other doctor who said the surgery was successful and the patient died. Better should it be successful and the patient should live. So that's the difference in Allah of Tchuya or Hutra. Hutra means it's a not an issue. Tchuya means it's an issue, but there's a bigger issue. <laughs> so the bigger issue overrides this. So he says, you see that the Poiskim, the Kesef Mishnah, the Rambam, they speak about, the Rambam says, Tchuya is Shabbos, Eitzel Sakonas Nefashas, and Hilcha Shabbos Peirik Beis. Because Al Pipnimi Yisatayda, that's the Nekud, it's not, Hutra means there was no issue. You didn't give in to Klippa. Tchuya means, no, there was an issue. The Klippa got something here. But the victory is much more powerful. You lost a pawn. It's not like you didn't lose a pawn. You lost a pawn like in the martial of the war. I went into a place where there were casualties. But because of that, the enemy came out en masse and now I can, into an open, open field and I can destroy it. That's the Nekud here. This explains the words of the Zoya that we started with. When the moon was blemished, in that element of of the negativity of the snake, this is the idea that the chitzoinim, the external forces, could nurture from her. When you allow yourself to be struck by the clip, by the enemy, you allow yourself. That's pshat, the moon got blemished. The moon got blemished as a metaphor for this element when I go into those places where I can be struck, I can be hurt. On this, the Pasuk says in Kehelis, It's a fascinating Pasuk in the Kehelis. There comes a time when the Adam rules over the Adam for his own detriment. What does this mean? Literally, it means sometimes when you're ruling over somebody else, it's not so simple, it's going to bring you down. For example, in occupation, sometimes a government takes over another country, they think, oh, we have all this power, and then you realize you don't know what to do with it, the people hate you, every Sunday and Thursday there's a guerrilla war against you, you can't feed the people, suddenly all the resources you thought you got are all for your detriment. You have to run a country, you have to know how to occupy, occupation is not a simple thing. You think you're going to rule over somebody else. Lerale, it comes to your detriment. Lerale, to rule over somebody else is not a simple thing. Darizal explains that this Pasek is saying something very deep about history. There's two Adams. There's Adam of Kedusha and there's Adam Blial. Adam of Kedusha is the Adam of Holiness. Adam Blial is the Adam of unholiness. Sometimes the Adam of negativity rules the Adam of holiness. And he's all excited. I took over the person of Kedusha. I took it up. I took him. I got him. I kidnapped him. I abducted him. I'm, in, I'm inside of you. The virus came in. I got your cells. Liraloi. <laughs> it's ultimately the beginning of his downfall. It's the beginning of his destruction. From his perspective... He got a foot into the door. From Kedusha's perspective, I have your foot. (laughs) 
Now I'll have your hands, now I'll have you, and I'll be able to chop you off. As long as you, as long as you didn't control me, I didn't have access to you. You were in your rabbit hole. You were in your, in your, in your cage. I didn't have access to you. You came now to control me. Now I have access. <laughs> now you can get destroyed. And that's the whole nekudah of, of what we're saying. That a person goes through journeys in life. Who took you over? The clipper took you over. Isn't that the most accurate definition of real trauma? A counterfeit Adam takes over the real Adam. And the real Adam's brain is now hijacked by a counterfeit Adam who's feeding off your energy just to feed the clipper. Whatever that looks like. It looks like it's anxiety, the guilt, the shame, the depression, the suffering, the anguish, the heaviness, the burden, the disassociation, everything we've been speaking about. People's journeys. The Adam, the fake Adam took over the real Adam. And as I said yesterday, I became artificial intelligence. The real heart is gone, the real soul is gone, and the clip is dancing from ecstasy. Comes Siddhis and says, the emesis, it's Liraloi. It's Liraloi. The neshama went into there. And the only reason is, Liraloi, to be able to ultimately destroy him. Because if he wouldn't be inside here, I don't have access. Because he thinks he's inside, now he comes with all of his troops. Like in the story of the Marshal of the War, I got them out into the open field and now I can bring in my real power and boom, knock him out. That's the Pshat and the Pasuk. That's the blemish of the moon. And based on this, based on this last night, I had an epiphany. It may be correct, it may be incorrect. But I'll share it. I wondered already for years what happened in our generation that so many people have been abused. It's unfathomable. Relatively, we live in one of the best generations of Jewish history with prosperity and freedom that our great-grandparents couldn't even dream of. I speak to Shimon Russell, Rabbi Shimon Russell, and he tells me, he saw 10,000 teenagers, he says one in four or five Jewish kids in the religious Jewish community before puberty, have gone through a traumatic sexual experience. Whatever that means. One in four or five, and, and I say, are you being a little dramatic? He says, no, the, to the other extreme. I speak to Avi Fischoff, who has dealt with thousands of, of, of hundreds and thousands of families and kids, and he tells me sometimes it's <laughs> more than one in four or five. But even if you want to say that to whoever deals with it gives crazy numbers, both by boys and by girls, by girls maybe even a little more, so in the secular world that exists, in the non-Jewish world that exists, but exists in the, in the whole Orthodox Jewish world. And you're talking about one in four, one in five, but even if you want to say it's all an exaggeration, which it's not, it's all signed one in ten. <laughs> so here this, so one in ten people sitting here in this room, so maybe you could say that this class is different because it attracts, <laughs> people think it attracts, uh, fine. <laughs> But you go in here to any of the tents, so it's only one in ten. You're talking about mind-staggering numbers, mind-staggering numbers. So on one level it demonstrates how unwell we are. We're unwell, the world is unwell. We have beautiful gadgets, we have beautiful homes, we have lots of food, we make beautiful kiddushim and bar mitzvahs and weddings. It used to be Donald Trump and another two people in the world flew private planes and today in Tom's River and in Muncie and in Borough Park, you can find Baruch Hashem, Groysim and Yonim from Yidin that won't go, chlal not on commercial airplanes, they only go on private airplanes. So you're talking about unbelievable progress in so many ways. And yet on another level, there's, there's toxicity and illness and unwellness and impurity and tumor that, that is very, very deep. So that's one part of it. But... My epiphany was that there's another part of it. This is a generation of healing. It's a generation before the ghoul. Everything has to be cleansed. So I don't think it's a random tragedy and mistake. It's horrible, but it's not random. It's horrible and horrific, but it's not purposeless. It's not meaningless. 
the bloodhound the bloodhounds can only defeat the enemy because they know the smell of blood. They know what it feels like. The ultimate tumen, the ultimate clipper gets destroyed by those who were affected by it. By those who their souls went into those places. Their souls recognize it. Their souls know what it feels like. Their souls know what it smells like. Our healing is not going to come from denying it. Our healing comes from when we can all realize that it was your soul, which is infinite, which is divine, that went through this journey. And the soul was chosen for it. It wasn't a random tragedy that you're a loser. Like Yosef at Tzaddik, the soul was chosen to go there. And it was chosen to go there for one reason. It was trusted that it can take on these experiences and take on this pain and not only not be defeated by it, but ultimately use it as a springboard to uproot and weed out all the impurity, toxicity, illness, unholiness, sickness, brokenness, lie, dis- deception, cruelty, especially when it's in the name of Judaism and God and camouflaged by people who are supposedly religious. I have no other way of explaining it. I get an email, I get a few emails, at least every day, at least a few emails. Sometimes it could be five, it could be 10, it could be 50. But every week, dozens and dozens and dozens of emails with the same, with not the same story, but he has another story. Baruch Hashem, imagination of clip is very fertile. Everybody has another story. But it's like, so it's like, it's like Ein Soif. It's like, it's not Ein Soif, because only one Ein Soif. But it seems like it's Ein Soif. It's like endless. And wherever it is, it is from Yerushalayim, and this is from Bnei Brak, and this is from Golders Green, and this is from Stamford Hill, so it's from Lakewood, and this is from Munson, this is from Kranai, and Baruch Hashem, it's everybody. <laughs> it's not like you could say, oh, this community is a very healthy, they got it right. Somehow nobody got it right. Clipper uses everybody and everything. It doesn't matter. And for Kurt, sometimes places where there was more, where there was more kedusha become more sick. Because kol agadol mechaveri yitzri yisur god. That's the point of this mimer. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. Trauma is not caused only by sexual abuse. There's verbal abuse. There's emotional abuse. There's emotional neglect, which is not even abuse, in a way that's more abusive. Because at least if I'm abused, I could say there's an abuser and there's abused. Emotional neglect, your parents were tzaddikim. Father was in shul all day, your mother was saying tell him all day. They're both tzaddikim. Huh? And there's intergenerational stuff. And epigenetics. Yeah, and there's bullying and there's emotional neglect. And there's so many different experiences. And then there's what's called the developmental trauma. A person sits in a school for 10 years and feels like a failure. Even though the principal is nice and the teacher is nice. And at the end of the year, he gets a plaque for Midas Toivos. I heard from Dr. David Palkowitz, a psychologist and y- teacher of psychology in NYU. So I heard from him that he was in camp one year. He was a kid. And he was not athletic. And he was not very good at Mishnah, he's Balpeh, whatever. So, you know, they give the certificates. Best camper, he was not. Best in sports, he was not. Color War, he didn't win, he wasn't. But they didn't want to insult him, so they wrote, good midos. Which for him meant, basically, you were the lo yitzlach of camp, so you have good midos. So when he came home, he didn't even want to show it to his parents. He put it in the suitcase, like he buried it, you know, like in a base Akvaris, under tent fachim, so nobody should access it. But his parents, I guess, found it. And he said his father and mother called him into the kitchen and they looked at it and they said, David, we want you to know that this, that you're a mensch, that you have midas toivus for us, it matters more than everything else. And he said it was that moment, you know, they, they, they touched him in such a positive way. So a person sits for 10 years, if I'm sitting in a school for 10 years or even for five years, think about yourself. Adults, yeah? You're not kids, nobody forces you. If you sit at a shear every single day for eight hours, and 99% of it you don't get or doesn't interest you. What are you going to feel like after a while? And you're forced to be there. What are you going to feel like? Huh? You're going to say, I'm a loser. Even though they tell you you have good middas and you're a cute kid and you're going to get a lollipop and you'll get a milkshake once in a while. 
But ultimately, you know, and even if they say you're trying hard, you feel like a loser. So nobody abused anybody. I'm just, these are things we have to be sensitive to. What I'm bringing out here, though, is another point, and that is abuse of, of sometimes such profound, explicit impurity and disgustingness that it's almost unfathomable. And it's not that it's most people, but you can have one, one monster who affects so many people. And sometimes hurt people can hurt other people. Very often not. They work on themselves. But often hurt people hurt people. When somebody has experienced uh, pre-puberty, certain things, when they develop puberty, a lot of challenges set in. So you have to ask, is it just a, a, a tragic phenomenon and it's all, that's what we have to deal with? But I think, based on what we're learning, that there's a much deeper and very powerful positive element here. And that is, this is all a preparation for transformation, for healing, for developing and inculcating in the Jewish people a consciousness of purity, of gula, of redemptiveness. It doesn't come without a lot of pain from these people. But that pain, essentially, is the blemish of the moon, allowing itself to be controlled by Adam Blial Liraloi, to take him down. For who said Maimed Azal Ba Nocha Shalchava? And this is the secret of the Gemara Shabbos Davkof Memvav Ba Nocha Shalchava Vehitl Bazoyama. It's one of those uh, Medrashim or Gemaras or Rashis you learn as a child, and you're like, okay. It says that the serpent had intimacy with Chava and he inculcated her with his dirt, with his filth. What do you mean, Ba Nocha Shalchava? So he says, Vehu Said, the words is Vehu Said. So it's a secret. What we call seeing the secret, if you're writing it, so it's not a secret anymore. Yeah, it's a sod fagan's broad. The pshat is it's a secret be'etzim. It's a secret because it's a very hidden reality. It's very sinister. It's exactly like molestation. It happens behind closed doors. Nobody sees. The guy grooms you for two years and gives you cotton candy every day and, and, lear and learns chumash with you and gives you prizes. That's how these things are done. They're very professional. It's a secret. Ba nachash al chava means the nachash had intimacy. What's intimacy? What's ba? Ba means intimacy. Like vayava, you, vayava in, in, in bia. Heisha miskada, heisha nikhtar, but kesed b'shtar b'bia. Bia is intimacy. What's the idea of intimacy? Intimacy is not that two people are friends. That's not intimacy. Intimacy is vahoyu l'basar echa. They become one flesh. And as Rashi says, in the child, you don't have, this is the father, this is the mother. It's a mixture. The genes of the child is tati and mami. Chromosomes of the mami and chromosomes of tati. The cell is the ma that starts off this fetus is mami and tati. So it's basar echad. In the child, you don't say, oh, okay, I see. The, your right cheek is from your mother. <laughs> your left cheek is from your father. <laughs> we sometimes say, your nose is this one. Your eyes is this one. But the child, who, who's the child? The father and the mother together. So what does intimacy accomplish? There's no more two. There's one. You are inside of the other person. The other person is inside of you. Is dapkus rucha berucha the lashon and zoya and tanya? Is dapkus? It's it's connection. So when you say the nachash comes into chava, it doesn't just mean he speaks to chava. Intimacy of nachash with chava means at some point chava doesn't know who she is and who the snake is. First days, that's the what happens. If the snake gives me advice and I could say this is the snake speaking, then I'm good. <laughs> Bon nachash al chava means it's intimate. The nachash now becomes part of chava. When you're married to somebody, yeah, you're part of that person. Hopefully it's a very good thing if it's not a snake. If it's a snake. <laughs> My sister-in-law told me, says years ago she went for kala classes. This is the early 80s. So there was an old woman, I got one of these who get teaching. So she gets up to the girls and she says, girls, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? A certain percentage of you will realize you ended up with a lemon. <laughs> that was the opening to, to her college classes. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> You're not going to have to wait 20 years. I'm telling you right now, some of you will realize you ended up with a lemon. And others with an esrig. Now you have to figure out who's the lemon, who's the esrig, Right? Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch and Hilchis Sukkah gives four sabanim how to figure out a lemon from an estrich. <laughs> but for all of them, you have to cup, cut open the estrich. You can't see it on the outside. <laughs> There's four sabanim, you have to cut open the estrich. 
So what's the nekud? The bon nocha shal chava is not a simple thing. It's that at the moment, that moment, ha- what happens at the eight sadas, what's eight sadas? Toi vira. What do you care if a tree has good and evil? That's the worst. Before the eight sadas, there was also evil. But it wasn't mixed. Bon nocha shal chava means I don't know what toi is and I don't know what ra's. I'm looking at a person. You have a child. He's looking at a person. The person looks like an idol, the person. The person screams, Kaddish, 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 and Shul. The person is a Baltzdok. The person may unfortunately be a Talmud Chachim too. But they're a snake. The person is a snake. The person is a venomous serpent. There is venom that comes from him. He is fa- he's, he's controlled by Tumma. It could be by sexual Tumma or by other forms of Tumma. A beard he has, and payas he has, and a can get in mikvah, and he can put in a bin of Tom's tefillin, and he could also know shas. A yid came to the Tzamech Tzedek, and he says, a chagadurach galarent, a chagalarent shas. He said, um, what's a shas dir galarent? I learned the Gemara, the question of the Gemara taught me anything. Or not. I'm not saying dafka person. You can have a person who doesn't know any of these things. However, the nachash comes. But this nachash comes in and I don't know who I am. I don't know who he is. That's the challenge of the Yitzhadas. It's toy it's, it's That's the lethal element of it. And that's what happens. That's the challenge of being entangled with the klippa. And that's why it's shalat ha'adam ba'adam. You rule over me because you took me over. And for years, I may not even know the difference. <sighs> this is intense stuff. I'm already, I'm already depleted from this shit. <laughs> huh? You gotta get to bitter shame here. Yeah. <sighs> but you can't get to bitter shame if you don't go through bitter edition. You know why? Because then I take the clip at the bitter sheni too. <laughs> you can't get the bitter sheni without bitter dish. People made that mistake. They want to take a spaceship and go straight to the moon. They don't realize that the clip it comes within the spaceship. <laughs> it's very important this. We want to go up. But the only way I can go up is if I get rid of my levushim atzayim, if I'm carrying excrement with me. It's going up together with me. And it's going to block everything. And it's a humbling process because I already got rid of it. I got rid of some of it. But you have to purge everything. You have to purge everything. When you purge everything, you can go up. Huh? You can't go to the mikvah with the sherets. The Rambam says in Hilchus Shuvah, Toivu Vesherets Biyodi. Why? Because if the sherets is in the mikvah, <laughs> I'm in the mikvah, it's a beautiful place, but the sherets doesn't let me become pure. So that's the whole idea here. So there's a shola to Adam, and I have to acknowledge that that Adam took control over me. But don't think for a moment that your core was compromised. Your soul was not sold. Your soul was sent. And the reason it was sent is because of its power, because of its courage. What do you say to Bavram? Shame. Shame, yeah. The, the, one of the most sinister forms of klippe is shame. And, and it's, it's so sinister because it uses Kedusha, because shame is a good thing. We say the Jewish people are Baishanim, Rachmanim, Gaim Lechasadim, you have Busha, you blush, you're shy, you're sensitive. Yeah, in a way, yeah, it's good. The Busha is a Bisho Baishanim. It's the opposite of Azpanim Legehenim, of Chutzpah and Audacity and, and, and aggressive brazenness. Yeah. Listen, there's a lot of people who get upset at me for talking about this openly, including in today's class. I don't think people sitting here, because you keep on coming back, so apparently you're not too appalled. But there's people, I always get letters, or I meet people, and they say, Genukshan, must speak. Talk about Edelkeit. Talk about Kedusha. What do you have to talk about this? So I say, Baruch Hashem, we have thousands and thousands of Shirdim about beautiful topics, Right? And Baruch Hashem, most people don't talk about this. I'm from the only few Mishagayim. So what do you have to listen to it? So why do I talk about it? The reason is because after every such class, 
I get probably 10 emails of people who say that they were completely destroyed. They wanted to take their lives. They were in a depression. And finally, they felt a little empathy and understanding of what they went through without telling them, shh, shh, their whole life, shh. Who tells them, shh, themselves? They're, they're their worst enemies, shh, shh. Because that's what the abuser did. That's the worst part of it. After everything that happened, I'm alone in the world. You know, Bessel van der Kolk told me, he says, trauma is not what happened. Trauma is what's happening right now. Trauma is not the event. Trauma is the loneliness that was created. It's what I told myself as a result of the event. Somebody can go through events. If they had a mother or a father or somebody else to really be there with them, I'm not going to say they're not, not experiencing pain, but they're in a completely different situation. It's the loneliness. I'm completely lonely, and there the shame feeds into that loneliness. You're going to say a word, everybody's going to look at you, and they'll throw you on the tracks of the train. Your family will be ruined forever. So what happens to that? So the result of that is devastating. We have to speak up. Everybody has to speak up. I told you, people who experience this, they smell it. They know right away. But we don't have a culture where people can speak. People have to speak about this. There's therapy, but there's also to be enlightened, to be aware, to be educated, to communicate on this level, to educate children what's right and wrong, to empower children, to empower teenagers, and to stop making people feel that they're the only crazy people in the whole New York City. Even though what they're feeling, there's millions of people feeling. To be able for them to be able to share, for them to be able to express themselves. We don't have to be afraid of talking about truth, authenticity. A Judaism that can't face truth is not worth anything. If all of Judaism, if what Judaism needs to survive is to cover up what's happening, then it's not worth it. (laughs) If this is what God amounts to, that you have to cover up truth, what type of God is it? (laughs) So it's another Avay Desire we're worshipping. So what do we have to call? So we should call ourselves what we are. Hashem alekim emes. Chesamish l'kadosh baruch hu emes. If Yiddishkeit doesn't amount to truth, if for Yiddishkeit to survive, we have to cover up corruption, abuse, lies, deception, right? Impurity. It's not worth anything. I can go to the Catholic Church. They, co- they also know how to cover up things. I can go to others who know how to cover up things. So what 4,000 years of Yiddishkeit amounts to? That you're not allowed to speak about what's going on? I can't understand that. Well, here everybody speaks. They don't have to email. (laughs) But I'm not pessimistic. I'm very optimistic. Because I think that what we're learning here is, is the source of all healing. And it's the truth. You see, truth is more powerful than lies. MS prevails. Emes may eretz titzmach. It may be buried deep in the ground, but it comes out. Reality always prevails. That's its nature. It's real. If it's real, it prevails. Fakeness is powerful, but not really powerful, because it has no substance. So truth will prevail. And truth is prevailing, because truth is real. You could, you could scream, you could ban, you, can ex, you, know, you could put truth in chedim, you could tell people don't listen to it, you could say it's the worst thing that ever happened, but it's true. <laughs> you know the word from the Kotzke Rebbe? It's Gewaldike word. It says in Medrash Rabbe, in Bereshis, Amit Epsimen, Parsha Ches, that when Hashem created the world, there were teams, right? Emes said, don't create the world. Emes Omra Al Yibarig. Truth told Hashem, don't create the world because this world is filled with lies. <laughs> so truth said, don't create the world. Huh? How did it know before the world? It knew. <laughs> it smelled. Emma smelled it. That's what it said. Shalom said, peace said, don't create the world. They're all going to fight. Chesed said, yeah, they're going to do a lot of chesed, create the world. And Tzedek said, they're going to do stuck create the world. <laughs> So what do you do? You have two against two. So the Gemara, the Medrash says, "Not al emes It's Hashem took emes and he threw it away. 
So now it's two against one. Tzedek and Chesed against Sholem. Fine, two against one. Achirab Latus. He threw away the Emes. Emes merits Titzmach. Hadusim Emes merits Titzmach. That's what the Medrash said. It's a difficult Medrash to understand. So the Katz Koskin Emes, I don't understand. Why did he throw away Emes? Why didn't he throw away Shalom? So he says, because if Emes is here, I don't care how many opinions are against it. <laughs> it's going to remain true. <laughs> you understand? You can have one opinion of Emes and a billion opinions against it. Who's going to win? The one opinion. <laughs> That's the nature of truth. Achrei Rabam Lahatus means... People think Akram Latus means you follow the majority. If you follow the majority when both views have truth in them, and you have to know which one is Allah Lamaisa. Akram Latus doesn't mean when you have many opinions that are full of it, and one opinion of, of course, not Akram Latus. <laughs> I once got an, a teenager once came to see me and said, he doesn't understand why we're Jewish. We should become Christian. I said, why? He says, it says in Torah, Akram Latus. <laughs> You should follow the majority. Well, there's only two and a half billion Christians and 14 million Jews. And from the 14 million Jews, most Jews are not Torah observant. I don't know, two, three million. So I said, a better question. You don't have to go to the Christian. Go to the Jews themselves. Most Jews are not shamed in Torah mitzvah. <laughs> he says, good question. And I said, the Muslims, 1.8 billion Muslims, also can't find a rabbi Right? Right? <laughs> but the question, of course, is based on a misunderstanding. Abul Hatas doesn't mean <laughs> to follow the majority when the majority is making a mistake. If I know the directions in a certain way, everybody could be screaming it's wrong, you don't follow the Rabbim. If it's Emes, I don't care if it's a Rabbim, it's not Negeya. Emes may edit Titzmach. Rabbim doesn't mean it's true. Rabbim only means, unfortunately, they have a lot of power. That's what it means. It doesn't mean anything. You have to know when it means something. If you have a Sanhedrin, that's a Kashra Sanhedrin, and they're Yiddish Shemayim, and they're Tzaddikim, and Bishame and Bishilal are having a debate, and they're both using the formula of Torah and Yiddish Shemayim, then Achir Rabbim Lahatus. If you have a bunch of criminals or a bunch of ignorant people who are clueless and not interested in knowing and not knowing anything, <laughs> what, no, what's Achir Rabbim Lahatus? Make sense what I'm saying? Does the majority agree with me? <laughs> Does the majority here agree with me or disagree with me? It's irrelevant. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> it's irrelevant. <laughs> Listen, when you hear truth, you know it, right? <laughs> Unless you're very sick, when you hear truth, you know it. And if you don't, you need some x-rays. You need some x-rays. <laughs> I hope this is not coming across as a depressing shia, because it's not. It's actually a very redemptive message. That's how I see it. It's a painful message, but it's a very redemptive message. A such a shalat to adam ba adam liralat. When the Adam Blial takes over the Adam of Kedusha, it's to its own detriment. All of the entanglement is to its own detriment. Because the truth is that the soul cannot become impure. The only thing can become impure is the way we perceive the soul. It's like the moon. The moon is not really blemished. The moon looks blemished. And that looking, the fact that it looks blemished is important because that's what we see. But the moon is not blemished. The neshama is never blemished because klippa can't blemish the neshama. What's blemished is the way we experience the soul. And that was a sacrifice the soul made in order to be able to destroy once and for all all the powers of impurity within itself, within its family, within its home, within its community, within its nation, and ultimately within the world. So when you're dealing with such things, don't get discouraged and don't fall into despair because you weren't sold you were sent and the soul knew exactly what it was going into and the soul was happy to go into it even though you have been crying for years 
And that itself the soul knew too. Because the love inside of you is much more powerful than all of the dirt and filth that comes from others who are perpetrators and who unfortunately have been stuck in Klippa for too many years and never learned how to liberate themselves from it. And you're not making the same mistake, so be thankful. They say when the Kloisenberger Rebbe was in one of the camps, so there was a Nazi who asked him if he believes that the Jews are the chosen people. So the Kloisenberger Rebbe said, yeah. So he gave him a kick in his head, you know, with his boots, these strong, good-looking, handsome, tall SS soldiers. Gave him a kick in his head and he fell and he was gushing blood. And he said, the to you, the cursed Jew, you still believe? The Gleibs Nachalt says uh, that the Judah, that the, the God chose the Jewish people. He says, Avada, of course. So he took his club and he beat him. And he was literally in a river of blood. He didn't think he would survive. And he says, how in the world do you believe that Jews are the chosen people? Look, look where we are and look where you are. And they say that the Kloisenberger looked up at him and they said, as long as you're the ones doing it and not we, then we're the chosen people. We're not murdering children. We're not murdering innocent people. You are. So we're the chosen people. That's what he said. There was a Yid. He, he was a... He taught in Mount Kisco by the Mechalber Weismandel in, uh, in Mount Kisco, uh, Nitri Yeshiva. His name was Reb David First. Reb David First, Zecher Levracha. He was in Auschwitz. He once said something incredible. <laughs> this is only the Nazis. The Nazis, a Nazi came in, an SS commander came into the barrack. And he said, I'm blind on one eye. One eye is real, one eye is fake. If anyone could identify which eye is real and which eye is fake, which eye I could see from and which eye I can't, there's a whole pot of food. You put in a whole pot of food, you get the pot of food. But if you make a mistake, I shoot you on the spot. Now, it's hard for us to understand what hunger means. We're talking about people who were hungry 24-7, and all you could, you know, when you imagine you have Yom Kippur three days in a row, all you think about all day is what? Food, 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 water. No, that no water, no food. You were given a drop of a little bit of food. You couldn't survive on it. So all, it takes away your humanness. You know, we, we, we could think about, we could talk about all these sophisticated things only because there's food. Because I have a drink in front of me, right? If for three, four, five, six, seven days you have a drop of water, you, you stop thinking like a human being. You become a mosquito looking for food, like an insect. So just understand what the Jews went through. People don't understand what that means. It wasn't just the torture and the death. It was even if you were alive, you were dead. You, all you could think about is food. So he comes with this pot of food, right? And he says, if you identify the blind eye from the real eye, you get the food. But if not, if you make a mistake, I shoot you. So nobody said anything. <laughs> They'd be hungry, but they'll be alive. There was one Al-Tayid, and he said, yeah, I'll tell you. And he pointed to the eye, and he said, this is the fake eye. He said, you're right. He gives him the food. He says, but how did you know? Rabbi David first was there. You know what this Jew answered? <laughs> you have to be astonished. He says, from your real eye, I always see the hatred that you have to the Jewish people. I looked at which eye I don't see hatred. And I knew that's the fake eye. I didn't see your hatred over there. <laughs> I knew that's not a real eye. Reb David first said, Givaldik, that's why Bilam says in Parshas Bolok, Ani hagever, sum ha'ayin. I am a man who has a blind eye. Three times he says it. I, I, don't, I never heard a blind person walk around and say, by the way, I'm a prophet and I have a blind eye. By the way, I'm a great man and I'm hunchback. By the way, I have a... Fine, you're blind, you're blind. When, the answer is, <laughs> Bilam was blessing the Jewish people, right? But he hated the Jewish people. He said, I have a blind eye. <laughs> Sumai, and that eye doesn't hate the Jewish people. I can't see negativity. 
his blindness allows him not to, not to hate them so much. So this he explained based on what he saw in Auschwitz. What I'm saying, that, what I'm saying is that it's important to understand who the winner is. When the Kloisenberger Rebbe said, I feel chosen because you're beating me, I'm not beating you. I'm not murdering German children, you're murdering Jewish children. It didn't make him feel good. He lost his whole family. But it made him feel chosen. It made him feel chosen. So everybody has to remember, it could have been also the other way around. Imagine if you were the perpetrator and your perpetrator was the victim. How would life feel then? I know it's not easy to be hurt by somebody. Trust me, I know this. But just imagine Khalila the other way. If you had to live, if you were sitting in my classes and you had to live your whole life knowing that you killed somebody else, how would that feel? That's what the Kloisenberger Rebbe said. As long I, 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 I'm going to come out of this war knowing I didn't murder innocent people. You're not going to come out of this war that way. I don't think the Nazi even understood what he said because if he would have understood, he wouldn't have been a Nazi. Maybe he did, I don't know. But the vart is, a, the, the insight is important. That's a form of victory because the perpetrator, unfortunately, for him, the klipa is so powerful, it took away everything. It took away his salam al It ate him up. The victim, you were hurt, but you didn't murder anybody. You were murdered, you didn't murder anybody. That's the beginning of realizing that you're in a much more powerful place because your soul is pure. And then the moment you realize that all the negativity is the clip there, not you, that's already a path to redemption. Okay, I have a woman's class in a few minutes, 9.30, so we'll take a break here. And uh, but I really want to finish the mimer, so tomorrow we'll have a class, okay? <laughs> 7.45, Wednesday morning. See you then. Have a beautiful, meaningful, inspiring, and truthful and authentic day. And don't be afraid of anything. The only thing we have to fear is fear. Slach et Abba. Surah's On the victims coming out, with the stories, the perpetrators probably not. What? Of course. They're, they're, they're hiding. But, uh, oh, yeah. they they ah. Oh. So, okay, Gavalda. So, so the perpetrators are chorus or what? What's this? They need to do tshuva, but it's gonna, it's painful. <laughs> Victims is painful. Perpetrators, I cannot even imagine. Exactly, that's my point. As painful as it is for victims, at least I know I didn't kill anybody. I have pain. I have to deal with it. It's a whole different level of... of, of, Maybe of, the, of, of and, and, so you understand how much they're running away from it. That's why they hate when you talk about this. Because it's shining a light. And they can't have a light shine on it. They're running away their whole life from it. I, there's those of them who repressed it. They don't even know they did it. Subconscious. It's subconscious by them. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. And actually for agreeing with me. Even though for truth, it's not Negea, but still, feels good. <laughs> it's irrelevant for truth, but it feels good. <laughs> this class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.